and welcome to The Fan Show. I'm Crystal D. And I'm Luke Spillan. 46 years ago this month, the Autons first lumbered out of shop windows and onto TV screens. So to celebrate, we asked you to choose your favourite Auton stories for us to discuss. Hundreds of you voted and 45% chose the 1970 debut, Spearhead from Space. Weird looking thing. Yes, sir. We'll get it into the vehicle and back to the unit labs right away. Joining us today are Doc 2 Magazine Deputy Editor Peter Ware and Big Finish cover designer extraordinaire Tom Webster. Welcome both. Hi Crystal, thank you. Hello. But before we chat about plastic shop window dummies, Luke, can you get us up to speed on Spearhead from Space? Of course. Well, in my opinion, Spearhead from Space is one of the greatest jumping on points for classic Doctor Who. It's essentially a reboot of the show. There's nothing really you need to know prior to it. Uh, at the end of the previous series, the Time Lords, in their first appearance, have sentenced the Doctor to exile on Earth and forcibly changed his appearance. Uh, they also returned his companions to their original times and places. The only reoccurring character beyond the Doctor is the Brigadier, the head of Unit, who has appeared twice before, fighting off invasions from the Great Intelligence and the Cybermen. It's also important to note that due to a BBC strike, this is the only Doctor Who story uh, filmed entirely on film uh, and on location, not in a TV studio, but I'm sure we will discuss that more later on. We definitely will. Thanks, Luke. Well, let's start off with talking about John Pertwee's performance as the third Doctor. Um, I mean, I think he gives a, a great performance from, from the word go. I mean, he's very to the point. He's he's very uh, unsubtle, plays it straight. Um, he's also a little bit of a macho man, I think. Uh, he likes cars. Uh, he's one of my first and favourite classic Doctors. Um, but what do you what do you think? How, how does he compare to previous Doctors? I, I think... The John Pertwee Doctor, right from the start, is much more of a show-off. I mean, he loves being the Doctor, he loves being himself. Hartnell, he'd try and keep himself to himself most of the time, try and keep in the shadows. Troughton, again, he'd, he'd be there, he'd, he'd be mucking around, but he didn't want to, to dominate the, the situation. Pertwee, from the off, just wants to show off. He's there, he puts the most flamboyant clothes possible uh, yeah. when he steals from, from the hospital. When yeah. he's opening a door in episode four, he instead of using a sonic screwdriver, he puts a little explosive charge the door blows and he goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> just to yeah. say, give me a round of applause, yes. here I am, I've mm. arrived, you know. Um, so, so yeah, he's a much more flamboyant doctor. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. I think it's very much, it's, I, I always like him, the doctors are kind of of their era and, and I'm pert we is, like you say, he's, you know, he's this doctor that's, that's of, you know, James Bond, John Steed from the Avengers. These are the heroes of the time and, and the Doctor, the third Doctor, is very much kind of of that calibre, I feel. Like. I was struck by the bit where he um, finds the car for the first time when he escapes from the hospital because he tries to get in a really average looking car and he just can't get in, he can't <laughs> break into that car. So he just hops over into the open top one. I, I like to think that the entire style for his Doctor just comes from him just rather enjoying that escape. Yeah. And going, actually, I'm just going to keep this cape and all of these velvet yeah. clothes. He's, he's defined basically from that first story by what he can steal. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, 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 yeah. it's really funny. <laughs> well, let's go on to um, uh, talk about that a little bit more. Um, I mean, this uh, episode is uh, contains many firsts. Uh, it's the first episode in colour. Uh, it's the first story of the Doctor's exile to Earth. Uh, it's the first appearance of Liz Shaw, the first appearance of the Autons, and of course, the first appearance of John Pertwee as the third Doctor. Uh, do you think this was a new type of storytelling? Uh, it was absolutely a new, well, not a new type of storytelling necessarily, but it felt and sounded like no other Doctor Who story before or since. It, it, it really is quite unique. It's all shot on film, it's all shot on location. Because it's all shot on location on film, there's this strange echoey quality to the soundtrack, which you don't get anywhere else. And I think the viewers, even if they were a bit unsure at the start of what this new character would be like, after such an exciting story as Beer, they would have stuck with it. More than that, by the end of the story, they would have realised this isn't going to be like Doctor Who that we've seen before. The Doctor's stuck on Earth now. He hasn't gone into the TARDIS and Koloff. Looking in the Radio Times, the next story, it's also got the big year again, you know? So uh, it, it would have been a completely new start for the show. It feels so real. It looks so stunning. It's so pacey. It's like a, that's a manifesto for where they wanted to go with it. 
Um, so it's a gift, actually, I think, but mm. it's yeah. unique like that. Yeah. I, I, I also find it's a real shame that that whole of season seven isn't like that. And, and it does feel like the show completely changes for the first time, like through from an unearthly child to... I mean, the War Games is... The War Games feels like a finale to that era of Doctor. I mean, mm. it is. It's a fun... The Time Lords show up for the first time ever, you know. It really is a... This is just an injection of just, like, this is what Doctor Who's going to be like now, and it's... It's great. Yeah. I, that's what I love about the Pertwee era, that it's its own thing. I really love mm. that. Well, this is Liz Shaw's first story. Uh, and I mean, I, I think, the, and this is the first story I saw her in as well. And I really like her. Um, I think she's very independent. She's very scientific. Mm. Uh, she keeps her cool. I mean, even right at the end where she's, you know, rewiring uh, the machine, uh, she doesn't bat an eyelid, you know. Um, uh, companions previously, you know, did a lot of screaming, an awful lot of screaming. And, and falling over and stuff. Um, and I also think, you know, talking about realism, I think, and, and being set on Earth, I think she really grounded uh, Who in the everyday because she uh, was so um, scientific. She questioned, you know, the Doctor and the TARDIS and things like that. So the, mm. for the first time in a very long time, probably since, you know, Ian and Barbara, she was very dubious of the Doctor. Um, so I think she's very different to what we've had before um, at this point. Uh, what do you make of Liz Shaw? So she's certainly um, different from what came before. She's the first grown-up female companion since Barbara Wright. In fact, the only grown-up yeah. female companion that, that we get really until, I don't know, maybe Sarah Jane Smith a little bit later on and then, then Donna, of course. But, um, and she's not his companion. She's, she's very much his assistant. Mm. Uh, and the Doctor sees her as an equal. He's one, she's one of the very few people who he will respect. Um, the Brigadier... He, he likes the company of, uh, and he'll, he'll give him some grudging respect. But Liz, he really does respect her opinion. Um, the other remarkable thing about Liz Shaw, played by the brilliant Caroline John, is that she has a different hairstyle in each of her four stories. <laughs> yeah, she does. Even in the Five Doctors yes. as well. Yeah. Yeah, she does. No, yeah. no other assistant or companion <laughs> can host her. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that we slightly lose a little bit of the um, relatability, slightly? Because you'd see the, the world through... I, I don't know really because the, the Doctor's previous companions were Zoe who was a super bright teenager yeah, which true. I don't think many people could relate to no. and Jamie who was a hairy legged Highlander from yeah. the 18th century who again brave young man but um, I, I don't think he was that relatable to the modern day so You hadn't really seen it since Ben and Polly really then. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right and also it doesn't need it anymore because it's all relatable anyway because we can... You've got all that earth-based stuff. It's all familiar yeah, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. The, the yeah. setting's familiar even the characters yeah. are slightly more intelligent than yeah. than yeah. your average viewer. And I, I think with Liz, over the four, sadly, four stories that she's in, you, you do, you do, I do in, really enjoy watching her and I do enjoy seeing them kind of bounce off each other. And there are really soft moments where you see a little bit more of Liz come out. And I really think if she had another series, I reckon we probably would have mm. seen a little bit more and more of that. And I think because you've got the rest of the story rooted in, in the everyday, um, I think having somebody who, who questions the Doctor, because most people yeah. would, she has very yeah. real reactions to the Doctor, um, mm. rather than, oh my God, this is amazing, yeah. you're an alien, yeah, <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. TARDIS, yeah. oh my God, this is so cool, you know, it's actually it's her going, oh, yeah. that's just ridiculous. I would have loved to have like... seen her first <laughs> scene in the TARDIS, can you imagine how she'd react to that? I find it interesting how she was kind of interviewed in, in episode one for this kind of doctor role mm. of scientific advisor and then all of a sudden the doctor turns up so you've got two for the price of one yeah and it's like the best kind of internship you can possibly have because <laughs> like you, you do feel sorry for liz though in a a way, because bit, she's yeah. the most brilliant scientist in the country's degrees in a dozen subjects yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden the only person in the universe who could trump her yeah. turned yeah. up the yeah. doorstep <laughs> just oh, when she together yeah. this yeah. Bad Here, ball, hold know. this test tube while i yeah. Yeah. be magnificent yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> She seems instantly amused, though, in that scene where they first meet. She really relaxes. Like, you can see it in her body mm. language. Like, I love how they get on. Yeah. Oh, like, she loves him. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. She's like, oh, this is great. Um, Quarries and uh, Corridors, a uh, very appropriate name there, says, uh, I like that it's the only classic uh, Doctor Who that could be remastered in glorious HD. And Jace says, because of the frame rate and picture, it feels more cinematic and the aspect ratio is more TV-like. Um, I mean, how good do you guys think it, it, it looks, uh, having uniform... Uh, I, I think considering look. the restrictions that they were under and that the whole thing was shot under adversity on location, because that, that was never planned. Spearhead was always going to be originally a, a studio story, mm. like all the, doc the Doctor Who's before it. Um, but for various reasons, they couldn't do that. So Derek Sherwin was faced with the problem of how to make this show. And go, well, all right, I'll do it on location. 
we use that building there, the, the, the BBC building. I'll yeah. grab the cameras, we'll do it, it's fine, we can make it work. And to, to his credit, he did. I mean, it, it, fantastic looking production. Because everything was destined for studio, you then un end up, like when we were watching it, you get these gorgeous, this hospital that yeah. is like, if it was in a studio, would have been three walls and the same double yeah. doors, and it would have just been slow. Very, very slow, very simple. But yeah, you get these tracking shots and handheld shots, and it's it just It did allow gorgeous. the director a lot more freedom. Yeah. yeah. Sort of freed up from the environment of, of the, the multi-camera yeah. studio. And it works so well. Yeah. It just, it, because, and it, it just emphasises that point way more of bringing Doctor Who home. So you've got these oh, yeah. just believable scenes and scenarios and settings. One of my favourite moments on that location, I think, which couldn't have been done otherwise, is where Channing uh, comes up behind the Brigadier through the glass. And apparently, uh, I think the director just saw that yeah. and just thought, oh, that looks good, I'll try that, you know. And Hugh Burden, who plays Channing, he's got such a naturally creepy face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> terrifying. Well, let's talk about the Autons, because obviously, uh, I mean, I think they are the most scariest Doctor Who monster ever. Uh, I think they're much uh, scarier than the Autons in Rose, because they were quite, you know, they're quite proper, they're quite perfect, you know. Uh, the Autons in Spearhead look quite yucky, in my opinion. They've got wet faces, hollow eyes, twisted limbs. They're, they're quite physically threatening as well. They, they move very quickly. Um, I think they stand up to, to the monsters of today in terms of scariness. Uh, do you agree? How do uh, the Autons and Spithead rank for you? It's not just the appearance, but it's the way that they move as well. They've got this fluidity of movement. Mm. And there yeah. was no formal choreography back, back in those days like there is today. But the scene where you see them approaching the, the bus stop, they're walking very coldly and calmly. Yeah. And the fact that they're silent all the way through it yeah. as well, um, and then they drop down and blast with their guns, it's, yeah, I mean, genuinely unsettling monsters. Yeah. And also, as we mentioned before, the fact that you could see them in any high street. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. always there, a bit like the Weeping Angels, um, introduced yeah. later, that you could see these things in graveyards, walking around, or statues on buildings. The Autons were everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I, was, I was thinking that um, they're totally convincing because they are just human in shape. You know, like the Cybermen, they're men in suits kind of thing. Um, but the fact that they play on the human shape, but they've got r really kind of featureless faces is qu quite terrifying. Mm. They're so strong as well. Like, yeah. Yeah. like you were saying, they're kind of, very, like the one that's just rampaging through the forest. And oh yeah. Just, yeah. They're, they're, they're quite loose when they're just like, go, and then when you see them later on turn, running, they but you feel yeah. like that autumn would just run through a wall and <laughs> oh, yeah. not even hesitate. No, I like, wouldn't have liked to have been a kid on a, going on a camping holiday in the near future. No. Like, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also the We're going for camping in the woods, kids. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Doctor Who stories become known as the one with the. Uh, this is the one where the shop window dummies uh, burst out and uh, you know they come to life and start rampaging down uh, Ealing High Street. Uh, th this is one scene that really stands out for me. I think it's my favourite scene of, of the entire episode. Uh, it's so scary, and I think what makes it so scary is it is just people being shot, and you and you see everything, mm -hmm. and uh, you know you, you see a hysterical woman, you see people running. I mean, these are very strong scenes of a, a, an apocalypse on your doorstep um, and it, this is not happening to our heroes on a spaceship this is happening you know to everyday people you could be innocent in, innocently waiting for a bus and suddenly an auton you know comes along and, and you've lost your you've lost your life you know uh, we rarely still see people uh, getting killed this way in new who I think it's very adult is this a scene we could have had in modern who um, according to the dialogue this is happening all over the country um, and possibly seem to be happening all over the world. The show didn't have the budget to show that at the time, but, but in later years, um, during Russell T. Davis and Stephen Moffat's era, we have had global catastrophes like this, with monsters invading all over the planet, like an army of ghosts, for instance. Um, the only time Doctor Who had done something similar before was probably something like the invasion. But there, most of the country just falls unconscious. They don't quite realise that the Cybermen have come out of the sewers and are, and are attacking London. Uh, but this, this, this was a massacre on a, a nationwide scale, according to the dialogue. So yeah, it was, it was huge for Doctor Who. And yes, it, it is something which, which is done today, but has to be handled quite carefully. In an alternate reality, we have an episode of Spearhead from Space where, in a Russell T Davies <laughs> yeah. Spearhead from Space, we have Autons uh, outside the Taj Mahal <laughs> and in yeah. Times Square. And you would have got quick jump and in, in, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all, it needed all that. And uh, what's yeah. the newsreader? Uh, New oh, yeah, yeah, the newsreader. What's her name? Trinity. Trinity, Trinity Wells. Trinity, Trinity Wells. Wells. There you go. Yeah. Well, she'll be reading a, a report and an yes. old one just comes in yes, and exactly. that's the end oh, of that. God. <laughs> exactly. 
Now, personally, uh, you know, I love this episode. Uh, I think it's really enjoyable to watch. Uh, it's terrifying as well. But as a story, it's actually quite uneventful. Uh, the Autons plan isn't very good, uh, and it's not clear what the Autons are up to. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, is it is it fair to say it's a vehicle for launching a new Doctor and a new companion in the series? Yeah, like Rose, it, it's both. It, it's mm. to introduce you to the new Doctor. It's to introduce you to the new whole concept of stories set on Earth with the Brigadier and with this new assistant, Liz Shaw. Also, it's a cracking monster yarn as well mm. um, with the Autons. I mean, this this thing was written by Robert Holmes, who mm. never wrote a bad Doctor Who story ever. All right. Stories like the Crotons and the Space Pirates and maybe the first four episodes of Trial of a Time World weren't <laughs> as well executed as they could have been, but they still had brilliant dialogue in yeah, them, and this, yeah. this story is no exception. Um, mm. Spearhead from Space is rightly held to be one of the classics of Doctor Who, both visually and in storytelling terms. Mm. Mm. I, think, I, think it's actually, um, I, I think it's actually quite a simple story, which, which mm. I think really works for this. Yeah. Like you said, like, it is the same as Rose. It's just... Alien invasion. Then there's a lot more, you know, like the whole the Autons are actually invading the world, but we don't see it. Then there's a lot more to almost be left to your imagination. Maybe that's not mm. a good story to anything, but th I think there's a lot more to it. But we almost don't need to see too much of it. You know, duplicates yeah. are being made of, you know, possibly, you know, there might be a whole other story where the prime minister's a duplicate and stuff like yeah. that. But that's another story for another time. I was expecting it to be more complex. I didn't remember. How, it's very simple. Yeah. It, it, it's no nonsense in a way, which is very much like the whole season. There's absolutely no nonsense about it. I think when it's at its best is when it gets under your skin. Um, psychologically, it's rather terrifying. Um, with the hypnosis between um, Channing... Hibbert. Hibbert, yes. Um, Hibbert struggles with that, uh, which will be touched upon yeah. again with the master. The back of his neck. Yeah, yeah that yeah. Kind of, yeah. I think you better go now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's, that really got on, under my skin and just... It's visually rather terrifying with the Autons. That's where it said it's best. And I think you're right. It just, it's all, the wheels are in motion before it's even began. Yeah, I don't think you needed anything more complex than yeah. the storytelling that you had. Like Rose, you don't want to confuse the audience with too many things mm. going on, otherwise you're just gonna, gonna lose track. My funniest <laughs> moment from this, actually, and quite a personal experience between myself and Tom, because we've known each other for <laughs> many years, oh, yeah. Yeah. is uh, when we were, when we, I remember watching this story very young, and yeah. uh, the line where the old man goes, Give me some grub, woman. I, <laughs> I remember you saying that to your mum at quite a young age because she quoted it from Spearhead from Spain. Yeah. It's quite a dangerous thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when my mum was like, Tom, you can't speak to me like this. I was like, no, it's all right. I'm a Spearhead from Spain. It's, it's Sealy. It's Sealy, mum. It's Oh, cook up a chicken nugget. It'd be lovely. If you yeah. carrots, you are <laughs> If you've seen Spearhead, then you know you might have noticed a lot of similarities in Rose, uh, and I, I also noticed some similarities in the Christmas Invasion and Deep Breath and and you know Eleventh Hour as well with lots of you know, post regeneration stories. Yeah. Is this one of the most influential Doctor Who stories of all time? Uh, undoubtedly, it is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Is this this is also the first story where the Doctor unambiguously is an alien, and he states to Channing. Well, I'm not human. I mean, we mm. get the clue in the first episode where we notice that well, the doctor's noticed that he's got two hearts. Mm. Um, but by the end of the, the, the story, we know definitely that this guy who's been following for the last seven years or so is an alien. But I love his reaction to the regeneration trauma. It's very third doctor. He doesn't, apart from some erratic moments, he's very cool about it. It's like, I've lost my memory, you see. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they communicate with their eye, but how did I remember that? You know, it's yeah, just very yeah. poetry yeah, yeah. still, even though he has no memory, but he's, he's just very cool about yeah, it, isn't yeah, he? That's true. Mm. Yeah, which I really like. I also think, on that, on that note about the eyebrows, uh, I think Peter Capaldi's doctor needs to go to Delphine. Because <laughs> wow. obviously, attack yes. eyebrows. Like, oh you know, this is, a, this is a story, a story waiting to happen. The Delphons wouldn't stand a chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. He'd <It's> accidentally <laughs> say some very naughty words oh with those furious eyebrows. I know, yes. Like, just look That's at them true. and he's insulting them. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first entirely subtitled Doctor Who story. <laughs> yes. No yeah. speech at all. A silent story. Yeah. It's waiting yeah. to happen. It's yeah. waiting to happen, yeah. Oh. yeah. Series 10. Series yeah. 10. Yeah. Series 10. Oh. Well, thank you so much, guys, for talking to us. And if you've never seen Spearhead from Space but want to give it a go, it's available on DVD, Blu-ray, and all your favourite download stores, links below. Plus, check out our favourite autumn moments here. There's also time to thank Jared for sending us this build inspired by the Cyber King that appears in the Doc 2 levels of LEGO Dimensions. Awesome work. Next week, we'll be popping back to the weird world of the old monster's home. 
Bye. Bye. Bye.